I believe the Lord wants to speak to us today. He wants to speak to us all the time, you know that? Sometimes we don't listen. I've titled, <coughs> I've titled this message, Sons of God Baptized with Fire. In Luke 12 and verse 49, Jesus said, I came to cast fire upon the earth. And would it would that it were already kindled, but it wasn't at that stage. The next verse goes on and says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am in agony until it's completed, which is his crucifixion. The fire one to send is the baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit. But he wasn't able to send that until he had been resurrected and gone back to the Father. He said, when I go back to the Father, I'll send you promised Holy Spirit. And so on the day of Pentecost, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and tongues of fire came and rested upon them. Were you baptized in fire? In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. A fortnight ago I brought you this word that I believe the Lord had spoken to me. It said, these are the days of awe and wonder, the spirit overflowing our hearts. A witness to this generation, the glory of God filling the earth. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. I'll do it for the last two lines first. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. So I woke up the next morning on the Monday morning as I, as I woke up, the Lord was talking to me. And he said, you need to look up what the standard is in Hebrew. So I looked up the interlinear Bible, which is a Masoretic text. And I was surprised to learn that it doesn't even mention standard. What it mentions is the Lord will make a way of escape. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will make a way of escape. But will you recognize it when you see it? Reminds me about the story about the man who was living by a, in a floodplain by a river and it was raining upstream and they were ordered to evacuate and the car came and said to the man, hop in, we'll take you to safety. The man said, it's okay, God's going to save me. You know the story? Flood water started coming into the house and the boat arrived and he said, they said, hop in, we'll take you to safety. And he says, okay, God's going to save me. And the next thing he was on the roof because the flood waters had risen so high. And a helicopter came and said, jump in, we'll take you to safety. And the man says, okay, God will save me. And the man died, drowned in the flood and he got to heaven. And he said, Lord, what happened? You didn't save me. He says, I sent you a car, I sent you a boat, and I sent you a helicopter, and you refused all of them. <coughs> Next, I want to address the first four lines. These are the days of awe and wonder. Do you believe that? These are the days of awe and wonder. The Spirit overflowing our hearts. A witness to this generation. The glory of God 
filling the earth. And the only way the glory of God will fill the earth is through us. So I want to go to Romans chapter 8 and starting at verse 18 to look at these scriptures, how they are forecasting that this is what it will be. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy or not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. There's a glory that's going to be revealed in us, his people, at this end of the age. These are the days of awe and wonder. Verse 19, For the creation waits in eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It wants the same freedom and glory that the children of God are going to walk in in this end of the age. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth unto now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of as sons, the redemption of our bodies talking about adoption of sons, it's being adopted into your inheritance. Look at that phrase, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We're going to come back to that. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we, to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans, Groaning's too deep for words. I think I missed something I was going to point out there. Just a minute, we'll go back to it. Here it is there. For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. When Paul was writing, that was the present time when Paul was writing. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. It's not that present time now. It's the time that he said, that what was coming is upon us. In, he was in the beginning of the church age. We're at the end of the church age. And... Jesus, or, or Paul wrote in Ephesians, he said that Christ was coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Coming back for a glorious church, a, a church that's walking in the glory of God, that, and that's what it says here, that we are to walk in the glory of God. But I want to look at this phrase, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. What does that mean, who have the first fruits of the Spirit? We could, uh, unless we know what first fruits are, we'll misunderstand what this phrase means. First fruits, there was a day of the Feast of First Fruits. It was the first Monday after the Passover every year. It was in the month of a bib. I've got a pencil here somewhere. The month of a bib, the first month of the Jewish year. It's not the the um, bait there to be. 
can sound b or v, depending on accents that are in the in the writing. So it's pronounced the month of Aviv. The month of Aviv was so named because they couldn't start the year until the barley was Aviv. Uh, what it means to be the barley is the barley harvest to be a biv. Was well, it wasn't quite ripe yet, but it was ripe enough to be able to roast and and eat the 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 grain, <coughs> roasted grain. It wasn't. I don't know if you ever looked at a barley or wheat head. As it's coming up to ripe, it gets milky and then it gets more solid as it comes on, but still green on the outside. And the grain isn't fully formed. But when the barley pump became a viv, it was you could roast it and it didn't disintegrate in the fire, in the oven. It had substance to it and you could eat it. When it was at that stage, it was a viv. So that was the first fruits. And they brought sheaves into the temple and they waved them before the Lord as a thank you offering for the harvest that was to come. Because it was the first fruits of the harvest. It wasn't the harvest, it was the first fruits of it. There was much more to come in than that. And he's saying here, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So what he's saying here is that you have the first fruits. There is much more to come of the Spirit. Revelation 4, 5 says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Heaven is a noisy place. You ever been close to lightning? It is noisy. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. You realize there are seven spirits of God? The Bible clearly says there are seven spirits of God. What does that mean? I thought there's only one Holy Spirit. Well, there is only one Holy Spirit, but there are seven aspects to him, the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11 and verse 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord, one, shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. So here we have the lampstand that is in the tabernacle in the holy place or in the temple, it represents the Holy Spirit, it represents the oil being burnt and providing light or revelation. It was across the room, on the other side was the table of showbread, which represents the Word of God. It was providing light for the Word of God. Without that, can't, without that lampstand being lit, the whole place was in utter darkness. So when it was lit, it revealed the word of God. And it was a seven-branch lampstand. And so we have this representation of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at how, what Paul is talking about, the fruits, first fruits of the Spirit. We have the first fruits, but the first fruits are indicating that there is more to come in. There was the barley harvest, and then that followed up after that was the wheat harvest and then followed after that was the harvest of of the fruit trees so we have this center stem here and it's by itself because in the description the, the spirit of the Lord is by itself and then we have couplets we have the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord or the awe of the Lord. And they're in colour because they're the colour of the rainbow 
and around the throne is a rainbow. It represents the Holy Spirit. It represents the sevenfold aspect of the Holy Spirit. It's one rainbow, but it has seven colors. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee? The word in the original Greek means he is the earnest, which is an old word which we probably don't use that much these days. But it means a portion, a deposit, a, a down payment, if you like. It was, it was the first fruits. Okay? The first fruits of the Spirit. Unto the, to, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Who is the earnest, the guarantee, the deposit, the first fruits of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, the fullness of it? And so when we got baptized, we got this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, who is the first fruit of the fullness of the Spirit. And so when we, we, when we have this and we just ask, Lord, fill us again, he fills us with oil to keep the lamp burning. Okay? So he says, keep getting filled. Keep burning. You remember the the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, virgins, how the foolish ran out of oil. You have to keep filling the oil up in order for the lamp to keep burning. If you wander away from God, the oil will run out. But he is, he is really kind to us because a smouldering wick he will not quench. He's talking about this. That he'll blow it back into a flame. So when we ask him to fill us and we haven't asked him for the other aspects of the Holy Spirit, we're just asking him to fill us up with this spirit, these first fruits again. And we need to be filled all the time. It's one baptism but many fillings. And the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins tell us that. So I want to ask you, what happened to the foolish virgins? They were locked out. And there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. So do not get into a position where you run out of oil. Then in verse 16 and 17, Paul goes on and says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So Paul is saying that you got the first fruits of the spirit, the, the earnest, the down payment, the deposit. But now I'm praying for you to get the next bit the spirit of wisdom and understanding. These were people who had been filled with the spirit, but he is saying, I'm praying, this is my constant prayer for you, that you get the next bit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding or revelation. Because in Colossians he says, so from the day we heard you we have not ceased to pray for you, asking you to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. It was very important for Paul that we get filled 
with the spirit of wisdom and revelation so we can know him. So we can know him intimately. So we can draw close to him and be in his presence. So now we have more fire, more light. But it's not the end. Because Paul says in Ephesians 3.16 that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power or might, the spirit of might, through the, his spirit in your inner being. Now he's saying, I'm praying that you may be strengthened why is he praying that you might be strengthened? Because unless you are close to the Lord, you cannot carry these next four for very long because they'll be too heavy for you. They'll be too much for you. The only way you can carry these is to be close to him in an intimate relationship with him. He wants you to carry them because he wants you to demonstrate his glory. And you won't be able to demo demonstrate his glory unless you have these. It's the spirit of power and counsel, the spirit of counsel and might. Why is it the spirit of counsel and might? Because you need to know what you should do. This is not, he doesn't give you his power so you can do what you want. In fact, we will have to give an account for every idle word that we have spoken because what he wants to give you is very powerful and he cannot give it to you if you are irresponsible. You have to be close to him. You have to be in intimate relationship with him. He said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We heal the sick in your name. And he said, be, depart from me, you evildoers. I do not know you. I have no relationship with you. You have no relationship with me. And so the main thing, as Janet said in her communion message, is that our intimate relationship with him. In fact, you will not get these, the rest of the Spirit, the rest of the fullness of the Spirit, unless you do have an intimate relationship with him. Sometimes we can only walk in this for short periods of time and we have to go back and pick it up again because we haven't realised that we've drifted away from him and we've actually put it down. So now we have five of the seven. The spirit of counsel and the spirit of might. Why is the spirit of counsel? Because he's going to tell you what to ask him for. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless my father tells me to do it. Or I see my father do it. That's the spirit of counsel. This, what he wants to give us, is not ours to do what we want to do with it. It's his, so that we do what he wants. In the Lord's Prayer, he said, when you pray, pray like this, say, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven which indicates his will is not done on earth unless we ask him to. And he has arranged it that way because he gave the earth into the dominion of men and he needs us to ask him to intervene in the affairs of the earth and we need to find out what his will is so we can ask him to do that. So we go on. And the end of the prayer in Ephesians 3 says, May 
have strength. I'm praying that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, the complete Holy Spirit. You may be filled with all that the Holy Spirit has. Now I want to look at this because it's confused by translators. It's not in the ESV. But in other translations I see it confused because it says that you may know, comprehend with all the saints the length, the, the breadth, the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It doesn't say that in the original. It has this little word here. And that you may know the length and the breadth and the height and the depth and know the love of Christ. It's two things. And if you have those two things, then he says, so that or that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We need to read the scriptures carefully and see what's there because there are many promises there, but they have conditions. To be filled with all the fullness of God, you have to know the, the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of the plan of God, his eternal plan. He's just told you about it from verse 1 in chapter 1. He's been un laying out the plan of God. He does the same thing in Colossians. He says that you may know the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, you notice in chapter 2, he says, no, chapter 3, he says, of Ephesians, he says, from reading what you read so far, you understand my, my knowledge of the administration of this mystery, the plan of God. So we know, need to know how God operates and how he works. We need to seek that. We need to find out, and that you'll get through praying and being filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's why he's saying that first. Then when we're filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we'll be able to comprehend with all the saints the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of it. And to know the love of God, that surpasses knowledge. Because he said, I'm praying this for you that you may know him better. What does it mean to know him better? To know his plan, how he works, his, what he's doing, what his will is, and to know his love for the world. You see, he's not wanting to give you this power and might so you can wield it however you want. He said, love your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you or despitefully use you. He is given us the ministry of reconciliation to bring people back to God, to bring them back to the knowledge of God. That is why he's giving you this. So you can be equipped in your ministry and your ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. When our fight is not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. But we have to know what his will is. The only way you'll know what his will is is to have the fullness of the Spirit and to remain close to him. So now we have the fullness of the Spirit all the fullness of God. It says that God was pleased to have in Colossians chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1, it says, God was pleased to have the fullness of God dwell in Jesus Christ and you have been made complete in him or brought to fullness in him. The word is to be brought to fullness. It means to have the full complement of what is required. 
And so that is our aim. That is where, that's the will of God. The will of God is to have us fully equipped. Because when we're fully equipped, we'll be more effective in his kingdom and in our ministry. Rick Joyner said in his book, The Torch and the Sword, that God told him that I give my power to those who are wise and mature enough to use it. I give my power to those who are mature and wise enough to be able to use it. He's not giving it to those who are immature because you will do great damage if you have it. And he cannot allow that. He also says in his book, the time is coming upon the earth when all must choose to walk with me or be taken over by the power of an evil greater than as yet has been known on the earth. There are dark, dark days coming. The Bible declares that. But he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. God wants his light to be upon you. He wants his fire to be upon you. And when it's upon you, and we're at this end of the age, I believe, that we'll be able to do what Jesus did when they wanted to throw him over the cliff. He just disappeared from their view. He walked out of that and they couldn't find him. There are many times when, when um, God rescued the disciples out of jail. He just opened the doors and let them out. The other times when Paul was in jail in Philippi and was in chains and they sang praises at midnight and the earthquake came and let set them all free. And what happened? The jailer and his whole family got saved. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will make a way of escape. That was in what the Lord told me, what he gave me. These are the days of awe and wonder, and they will be great they'll be the greatest days for those who are walking close to God. We'll see exploits. We'll do exploits. Jesus said we'll do the same things as he was doing and even greater things. These are the days of war and wonder. The Spirit overflowing our hearts. The fullness of the Spirit overflowing our hearts. A witness to this generation. But our fight is not with them. We are to be a witness to them. We are to show them the love of God. The glory of the Lord filling the earth. Why? Because his people are walking in his power and authority, which is his glory. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand the Lord's will, or what the Lord's will is. Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. He links this up. Know what the Lord's will is. What's the Lord's will? To be filled with the Spirit. He wants you to be filled with the fullness of the Spirit. That's his will. Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigns through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You want to reign in life? Well, there's two things you've got to do. You've got to receive his grace, his abundant provision of grace, which is, his divine enablement. And you have to receive his free gift of righteousness. You have to stop saying, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, if you are saying that. 
and start saying, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. They are both scripture. I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Luke 11, he said, Seek and you will find, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The emphasis is you have to ask, you have to seek, and you have to knock. He said, How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You have to ask. He will not give you what you don't ask for. You had to ask for salvation when you heard the salvation message. You had to ask for baptism. You had to ask to be filled with the Spirit. Now he's saying, I want to fill you with the fullness of the Spirit. But you've got to ask me for it. So I made a list of things that you need to do. And you'd be wise to take this list down. Number one, being filled with the fullness of God. Ask God to strengthen you in your inner being and fill you with his fullness. Father, strengthen me so I can be filled with the fullness of God, the fullness of the Spirit. Two, seek and ask for the Spirit to reveal you God's eternal plan. Do not be foolish, but know what the will of God is. Know how he's working. He has revealed it in his word. It's there, but you won't see it unless you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. It will elude you. You will read it and not recognize what's there. Or you'll hear it and go out and forget all about it. Three. Receive his gift of righteousness and abundant grace. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's part of the armor of God. But he said, you cannot reign in life unless you receive his abundant provision of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Five or four. Seek to experience and stay in the love of God. Seek to experience it and stay in his love. The best way of doing that is thanksgiving and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It attracts him to you. You can't resist it. Five, sing spiritual songs with thanksgiving. We have so much to thank him for. Thank him for his crucifixion that enabled us to be set free from the bondage of sin and death. Thank him for his baptism in his Holy Spirit. Thank him that he promises to stick closer to us than a brother. Thank him for he has promised to stay with us until the end of the age. Thank him that he loves you with an everlasting love. Thank you that he has good plans for you to come into. He has an inheritance for you. Thank him for just who he is. Seek, seek to stay in his presence. Not just when you come to church on Sunday. I know from experience he is with me all the time. I hope he's with you all the time. Years ago I was um, praying for two hours a day. And I had a vision, and on the vision there was a computer screen that said, lost connection, redialing. 
And I said, God, what is this about? He said, get broadband. Stay online all the time. Stay online all the time. Be available all the time that he can speak to you. My sheep know me and I know my voice. Do you know his voice? One of the best ways I found of knowing his voice is ask him questions. And I've got lots, if you know me, I've got lots of questions. As Arthur tells me that his minister in England said, to develop an inquiring mind. Be curious about the Lord. Be curious about the Lord. <laughs> if we will do this, the Lord will come close. If we will press in, if we will ask, if we will seek, if we will knock, then we will be filled with his fullness. That I am confident of. But I just warn you again that you've got to stay close to God, otherwise you will not be able to carry it for very long. Because if you're close to God, it will be light. But if you walk away from God a little bit and start drifting away, it will become heavy. That is your indication that you have wandered away from God and you need to come back to him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much even before we knew you, you loved us with an everlasting love. You valued us so much that you sent Jesus to die in our place. And we are very grateful. You have translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son you love. And you are willing to share everything with us because that's why you made us in the first place in your image and likeness. Lord, help us to understand Continue to give us your wisdom and understanding. But Lord, we, we hunger after your counsel and might. Counsel us into what you'd have us to do and how to use your power so that others might come to know Jesus Christ. Teach us about your love. Show us how to love. Transform our hearts. And Lord, bring us into the fullness, the full complement of what you have decided to give us before the foundation of the world. This is not something that is a recent thing. This is from your plan from the beginning. And so, Lord, we ask you to complete the good work that you have begun within us so that we might stand on that day and say so with Paul, I've completed the race. I've completed my course. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.